One says on the top, get the log out of your eye, and the other one says, regretting things I said. So you should have two of them there in front of you. So let's begin with the word of prayer. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, we look forward to your many blessings to us each and every day. We ask you to be with us this evening as we talk about a word of word of scripture that says we need to get the log out of our eye before we can see that speck in our brothers. Help us take those words to heart so that instead of focusing on our own desires, our own will and way, we focus on your will and your ways. Be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. We'd like to begin with a little video, so let's run our video.
Bible verse that says, as we said in the beginning, get the log out of your eye. Plank in some versions, before you can take a look at the, the, the speck the, of his brother's eyes. It's part of the challenge, what we do in our conflict management. Okay? Because we really want to struggle through some of these things. Go back to uh, Psalm, or Proverbs 19. It all sort of stems from some of these things. This week and next week as well. Proverbs chapter 19. It tells us there in Proverbs chapter 19, verse 11. A man's wisdom gives him patience. It is to his glory to overlook an offense. To overlook an offense. So as we think about getting the log out of our eye and some of the things that go on there, that's the really basic first question. First thing on your sheet. Is this really worth fighting over? Is this really worth fighting over? Because you need to understand there are two kinds of logs we want to remove. Right, that we can be struggling with in dealing with our own lives. Is that kind of over here? Zach, can you get to that? Okay. One is a critical negative attitude. A critical negative attitude that leads to unnecessary conflict. Some people just have that consistent critical negative attitude. And that just leads to unnecessary conflict. It can be a big log in people's eyes. That can stop them from seeing things that are out there. And certainly then the actual sinful words and actions or words and deeds that we actually commit. We talk in confirmation of time about actual sin. You know. That's the sin that we actually do. Those actual sinful words and actions. Two kinds of logs that can be in our eye. And so we need to understand God really commands us to try and overlook the minor offenses. You go back to Proverbs chapter 19. Go back a little bit to chapter 12 in Proverbs. It's consistent stuff in the book of Proverbs. It just speaks to us. Proverbs chapter 12. In verse 16. A fool shows his annoyance at once, but a prudent man overlooks an insult. Go to Proverbs chapter 17. Proverbs chapter 17 tells us in verse 14, starting a quarrel is like breaching a dam. So drop the matter before a dispute breaks out. Starting a quarrel like breaching a dam. It's a real dangerous thing. So we're challenged by scripture in several other places as well to try if we can to overlook minor offenses. And why do we want to do that? Well, certainly to imitate the Lord. To imitate the Lord. The psalmist tells us, and you probably know the verse, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. So it behooves us, if you want to imitate God, I remember that our Lord and Savior. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever, says the psalmist. Slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. So you want to imitate God, then we need to try to overlook as much as we can. When should we do that? Well, if the offense is not publicly dishonoring God, generally, if it's not publicly dishonoring God in some way, we should try to overlook it. If your relationship with that person or group, whatever it is, has not been permanently damaged, perhaps we should try to overlook it. If others are not being hurt through all this, And Paul gives us some instruction in Philippians 4. Go to Philippians 4. Paul's letter to the Philippians was a very interesting one. Written from prison, 
and, and a lot of words about joy and rejoicing in there. Some call it the letter of joy. In chapter 4, he understands there's some things going on that concern him because he's not with them right now. He's in prison. And so he gives us some thoughts and some concern about how to deal with things. In chapter 4, beginning in verse 2, he says, I plead with Theodia and I plead with Syndicate to agree with each other in the Lord. Apparently, something's going on between them. We're not told what it is. We're not told exactly what the nature of the difficulty may be, but apparently it's enough that it's reached Paul. He says, I plead with these two gals, agree with each other. I ask you, loyal yoke fellow, so I'm putting in there Sisyphus, which is a, a name for just a statement like loyal yoke fellow, help these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. So these aren't just any two folk. They're people who apparently have been working alongside for the cause of the gospel. These are people who have been actively involved and engaged in things that have been going on. Not just two people who can't get along. They've been working by my side, so they we work together. Rejoice in the Lord always, and I'll say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, noble, right, pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. So he gives us some pretty uh, spiffy instructions there, which all seem to involve change your attitude. Change your attitude. Mom or dad ever tell you that once in a while? Get rid of it. Drop the attitude. You ever said that to some of your kids once in a while? You know, lose the attitude. Only one of us here gets to have an attitude. That's the mom or dad. <laughs> Drop it. That kind of thing. And you can shout. That is one thing that you have a definite choice over. And I know choice and decision, no, it's not good words in Lutheran circles a lot, but you do. You have a choice about your attitude. That's why some people will say, and I hear this particular group that talks about this stuff in conflict, say all conflict is intentional, not accidental. Because you have a choice. I say something to you or do something to you, whatever else, it may stir up your loins. But you have a choice of how to react. You may not have a choice over what was said or what was done or how it was said or how it was done. But you do have a choice in how you react. And that's what makes it intentional, all conflict. Because you can choose to react in a way that's very conflictual. Is that a word? Conflictual? I don't know. Or you can choose to react in a way that lessens conflict and is not very conflictual. But that's your choice. Not the other person's. That's your choice. Paul seems to say, change your attitude. Rejoice in the Lord always. I get what he's saying. He says, if you didn't get it, rejoice. Show your gentleness. Let that be evident every way. Replace your anxiety and your worries and your stress with prayer. See things as they really are, and practice everything you've learned. That's all got to do with your attitude. Change your attitude. There's some powerful things in there. Is this worth fighting over? Okay. And God commands us if we can try, uh, overlook. Okay? Because a lot of times we need a real reality check on our responses to conflict really going on. Remember we asked you the first week on that slippery slope of responses to conflict, what's your default? Where do you slip and what's your own? And when push comes to shove, how do you react most of the time to conflict? Then we said the hard question is, if I go to your spouse or your neighbors and ask them what they think your default response is, will they answer the same way? Will they say it's the same thing you think it is? Or will they say, well, no, my God, this is how they react. He or she says, it's this, well, let me tell you the truth. 
faith. That's a struggle. They'll change their attitudes sometimes. Maybe reality check. See, because for Christians we struggle with that, right? You know, rights. Rights are really privileges given to us by God. Not what we think they are a lot of times. And for us, the big word as Christians is not necessarily rights, but responsibility. In fact, earlier in that letter to the Philippians, that really famous chapter, or section from chapter 2, that says, have the same mind as Christ Jesus. Have the same mind as Christ, as Christ Jesus. Let's take a look at that. Go to Philippians. We were in chapter 4 a few minutes ago. A little bit earlier to chapter 2. <clears throat> Beginning at verse 5 in chapter 2. Your attitude, which all has to do with your mindset, should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. What rights did Christ give up for your redemption and mine? What's that? All, it all it still boggles my mind after 40 years and 44 years of ministry and more as a Christian that Jesus would do that. Give up, set aside all those rights of his God to become a human being. I can't begin to imagine what that must have been like. We have to do that. For me? For you? To give up all that, set aside all those things. He didn't think equality was something to be grasped. He just became obedient even unto death. For me. And then we struggle with the other part. Thessalonians tells us, Philippians tells us, Rejoice always. How can we do that in the midst of a conflict? Because I don't know about you, but most of the conflicts, maybe all the conflicts I've endured in my lifetime, have not brought joy. First thing I thought of was not, oh, happy, happy, joy, joy, I've got another conflict today. So how can you have joy in the midst of conflict? How can we do that? Well, if we're giving it to God, and if we're understanding that peace that talks about in Philippians and that peace that has no understanding, and we know that God is there, then it can help me rejoice. Remember we talked about glorifying God? We said the whole first part of the principle, we glorify God and all this, how is he getting blessed and all this? How are we doing after all these things? If I'm keeping all that in mind, it can enable me to rejoice that yes, God's being glorified here and how I'm behaving and whatever else. So, go back to Proverbs. Proverbs 28. I'm going to take a look at some of this stuff. Maybe some of the hard things that are there. Proverbs 28 tells us some things about how we're going to go through some of this. But the next section says we have to examine ourselves, kind of like what we talk about in communion, but in a few little different ways. Proverbs 28 tells us in verse 13, He who conceals his sins does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy. Finds mercy. I trust by now you understand the difference between grace and mercy. What's the difference between grace and mercy? You say grace is that Hebrew word, undeserved love and favor. What's the difference between grace and mercy? Grace. 
What's that? You got it. Amen. That's it. Grace is getting something we don't deserve. Look, mercy is not getting what we do deserve. It's like when your parents let you have the car for the first time, and you go out with the car, and you bring it home, and it's got a dent in the fender. And you're not quite sure how you want to explain that, particularly to dad, maybe mom too, I don't know how it goes in your household. And so you drive home with the car, you pull up, and not only are you coming with a dent in the fender, but you're two hours later than you're supposed to be home. And you pull up in the driveway, and dad comes out and says, where have you been? Well, you know, I kind of had this little thing thinking about when we get home, and I thought, whatever else, and he looks at the car, and then the car, and dad says, hey, it's okay, go to bed, we'll talk in the morning. Right? <laughs> oh, I wish. <clears throat> See, that's part of it. Mercy would say, yeah, that's good. What you might deserve is I'm going to be grounded for six months, your license is going to be suspended, not but dad decides not to do that. He becomes merciful. Not giving you what you might deserve. So our God is gracious and merciful. So you change your attitude. So he who confesses and renounces his sin and finds mercy. So we need to examine yourself. And we start by taking an honest look at yourself. Taking an honest look at yourself. Search me, O God, said the psalmist, and know my heart. You can trust me in this. God knows your heart. You can take my word for that. God knows your heart. We may not always be willing to confess and step up and say what's in our heart. We may try and cover it up. We may want to not be ready to admit it. So you need to take an honest look at yourself. What's really going on in your life? And then you need to understand that despite what the song by Boston says, repentance is more than a feeling. More than a feeling. Repentance is more than that. Repentance is, is godly sorrow. Just being remorse or sorry and that thing about, well, well sorry, Sorry. Repentance is more than that. It's more than that. It's more than just a feeling. Godly sorrow comes when we really see sin for what it is. What is sin, really? Every time we sin, it is what? Really? It's an offense against God. Every time. No matter how insignificant we may think it is. We're smacking God in the face. We used to use that example in confirmation sometimes. That we got into some more of our, well, our politically correct kind of stuff. And I usually pick the biggest child in the class, and I'd say, okay, stand up. Now, what happens if I go up to that young boy and I got a girl, whatever it is, and I go, back side of the head, and I say, oh, gee, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. How long are they going to stand there and let me do that? A lot of times what I would hear was, not more than about once, Pastor, I'm going to lay you right out. You know? <laughs> and, okay, but I said I was sorry. Every time I said I was sorry. But you didn't really mean it. How'd you know? Because I kept doing it! <laughs> well, that's still a struggle for us because we are sinners. But when we talk about godly sorrow, when we talk about really understanding it's more than a feeling, we see, understand that genuine repentance leads to changed behavior. That true condition of repentance is saying, Lord, I understand there was a sin, and I, I really need your help to not do it again. I might, because I'm a sinner. But Lord, if I'm really repentant about this, I'm really sorry, I, I'm asking for your help. Help me not do that again. And then we keep trying to move forward in that kind of a path, that kind of a way. Is that easy? Uh -uh. In fact, for a lot of us, it's a lot harder than we really want to admit. 
because sometimes those things we're doing fit into that category of our pet sins. Those things we kind of like and sometimes even think we're good at. But they're still sin. We struggle. So repentance is more than a feeling. Genuine repentance leads to a changed behavior. It begins with confession. It's the first step. The best. It then goes to sort of making restitution in whatever it is. If that means financial restitution, if it's relational restitution, whatever that restitution might be, need to work on that. What do I need to do to make restitution here? To make it right. Again, it might be financial, it might be, it might be, it might be other things. What do I need to do? And all that then leads to change. Change. If I'm unwilling to change, can I be truly repentant? It seems not. Because that's what you hear sometimes from some people. Well, I'm sorry I did it, but you know, I'd do it again in a minute. You ever heard that? Have you may have ever said that to someone? You know, I'm kind of sorry I did that, but you know, when you push up to shove, I do it again. I'd do it again in a minute. You struggle through some of that. But there are some great benefits to genuine repentance. Some of the great benefits are that we can have a clear conscience before God. Clear conscience before God. If I've been genuinely repentant. You've heard it said before, and you hear it, I'm sure, in your life, maybe by your parents, maybe you say it to your kids. If you tell the truth, you don't have to worry about a lot. Because when you start down that path of lies, I gotta start remembering what was a lie, how do I tell it, how do I keep it up, how do I perpetuate it, how can I make sure it and now I've got to follow and while it gets you down a whole wrong path of all kinds of stuff. If you're genuinely repentant, you can stand before God with a clear conscience. You don't have to worry about what you're still covering up or what you're still hiding or what you're still with. Did I forget to do that? Oh, well, I better make sure I get that right. And you don't get stuck with all that. Because I can have a clear conscience before God. Wow. That's awesome. It can also be the first step toward uh, any constructive change. Because change is one thing, constructive change is a whole other thing. I can change for change's sake, but it may not be constructive. It may be destructive change. Because it may end up making things worse. But genuine repentance can be uh, a first step toward any constructive change. And it can certainly, hopefully, set an example that other people are going to follow. It can set an example for anybody else who's wrestling with it or watching what's going on to follow. And guess who watches you a lot in your family? Your children. When do they start picking up on things you do and say? And here, whatever else. I am amazed, for instance, as a parent, and I'm sure I was this way as a child, and I'm sure you were, and I'm sure you were as a parent as well. When was the first time you taught your child to say no? <laughs> and were they saying it a lot before you ever even thought of teaching them that word? No. 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 And you sat there, I'm sure, and said, okay, let me teach this. The, the little word, and oh, you say it like this. No. And you can say it different ways. No. No. No, 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 no. I don't know that we ever sat down with our children and did that. And I don't know if your parents ever did it with you. But boy, they're quick at picking it up, aren't they? And they're quick at understanding what it means and what it can do, don't they? Want to go here? No. Can do this? No. examples. You want to set an example that others are going to follow. And you are one, whether you want to be or not, 
You've heard over the years, sometimes some of our sports figures and others have talked about, well, I'm not an example for anybody. You know, don't make sure you follow me. I'm not an example for anybody. You are, especially when you're in the public eye like that. Whether you want to be or not, you're thrust into that. Don't have much choice sometimes. And so you want to be able to set an example, others are going to follow. And if you think that only applies to people in high profile things, there's that old Hebrew word for that, hooey. You can be an example right where you are as well. Maybe it's in your workplace, maybe it's in your neighborhood, maybe it's here at church. Because you never know who may be looking to you for, wow, that person's really kind of awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you never know when you might be the example. You come into church and, and you, you're just really want to sit down and you rejoice. You're seeing the whole are doing all this stuff, and the person who's sitting behind you had a bad week, and they came to church and they're feeling bad, and they say, "Wow, that person's singing, and they're all excited." They're, I, what an example! Of the way to lead my feet. Wow, that's awesome. And they may never say anything to you about it, anything else, else but wow, you just lifted, made their whole day because you were there singing and doing all kinds of neat things. And the opposite could be true as well. They can come to church all excited, and then you're sitting there going, Hallelujah. And they might go, wow, this person's really excited about their faith. Maybe I shouldn't be here either. And I've tried the experiment. When you talk about example, I haven't been able to make it work. Maybe some of you have, I don't know. I was always told that uh, one bad apple spoils the whole bunch. So I said, let me check this out. So I took like a uh, quart, whatever they are, of apples, pints, whatever they come in, and the city kid on all this stuff. And it was nice good apples. I put a bad one in there, and yep, it was right. I mean, yeah. So I said, I wonder if the opposite's true. So I took this little pint of all these bad apples, and I put a good one in to see if it would make the rest good. Didn't work. Didn't work. So I want to set an example. You know? So you can examine yourself. You want to take an honest look. You want to understand what the importance of repentance is. You want to realize there's some great benefits of genuine repentance. See? Because the challenge we have as Christians, here's the hard part for us as Christians, is conflict often reveals our idols. They may not even all be American idols. Anyway, oh, 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 bad, bad. You see, we wrestle with all that because you know what? Unbelievers and people who we think are heathens or pagans or all these kind of crazy people aren't the ones, the only ones who wrestle with idols. We as Christians deal with idols all the time, and conflict tends to bring them out. And often not in the nicest ways. You have to understand that as we take a look at who and what we are all about. What are some of those idols that we wrestle with? Well, certainly one idol is improper desires for physical pleasure. Go to 1 John. 1 John, not the gospel, but the little 1 John letters in the back. 1 John. Chapter 2. Look around verse 15. He says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and he does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. So an improper, notice, improper desire for physical pleasure. There's nothing wrong with wanting physical things or physical pleasure. But when it becomes obsessive, and for some people it can be, obsessive. Be careful with that. And sometimes our conflict can bring that out. If 
might be because we're debating and having conflict about some physical stuff, some physical pleasures. That's creating the conflict. And it can take over. Our idol can come out and we can move oh, out. Wow. Certainly another one that we wrestle with is pride and arrogance. Pride and arrogance. Go back to Proverbs. Pride and arrogance. Proverbs chapter 8. Proverbs chapter 8. Beginning at verse 13, or read verse 13. To fear the Lord is to hate evil. I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior, and perverse speech. The idols of pride and arrogance can get in the way of a conflict. How can that happen in churches? How can pride or arrogance get in the way of a church conflict? Now, I'm not talking about here, so we don't have, I'm talking about other churches, okay? Like the one across the street, the one up the road, and other places. Okay? But, but how can pride and arrogance get in the way of church conflict? Because I know I'm right. Because after all, my family's been in this church for 48 years. We know what's been going on here. You've only been here two, three, four, five, twenty years. What do you know? My dad helped build this place. I've been a Lutheran for as long. You talk about changing hymnals, you don't know nothing. You ain't Lutheran. You come from one of them Pentecostal Methodist thinking singing churches that sings all this happy, happy, clappy stuff, and now you decide to become a Lutheran, and you don't know what you're talking about. Pride and arrogance can get in the way in church discussions and arguments. And again, that's those other places that doesn't happen here. I'm glad it's okay. But we can really struggle with sinful thoughts that can come out of that when you're in the midst of a conflict. And some of those things can rear their heads. We've never done it that way before with good reason. Pride and arrogance can really come out because that's a real strong idol of a lot of churches. Another one we wrestle with is the love of money or other possessions. And that great passage that's been abused so much is the, the, the love of money is the root of all evil, not money is the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. So the love of money or other possessions can really get in the way in a conflict. How so? Have you ever been in a conflict with someone who you think has more than you? Have you ever been in a conflict with somebody you know has less than you? And can that rear its head in that conflict? You betcha. You betcha. You now it can rear its head kind of crazily in all that. I was at a church once where one of the families come and talk to me, and it wasn't really a conflict so much they were involved in, but some strange feelings they were having. And they said, you know, we've got a neighbor, and the neighbor was a Mormon family. And they had two children the same age as their kids. And they would say, Pastor, their kids, every time they get a couple extra bucks, they're putting it away for their mission trip that they go on when they're 18 or whatever it is. Our kids put their money away, and they spend it all the time. How can we, we get them to have more of a habit like that? And then I had another family who came to me one day and said, you know, Pastor, I'm struggling. What are you struggling with? Well, I live next door to a guy who works at the same factory I work at, has the same basic job I have, so I kind of know what he's making. I kind of know how much money's coming home. And, you know, we kind of live check to check and month to month, and our kids, we try to do the best we can for our kids. But we look over at their house, and they've got a ski doos in the yard, two of them on the trailer and the thing. They've got a cabin up north. They've got, you know, an extra uh, SUV that pulls it all around with them and all that kind of stuff. And I don't know how they do that. How do they make that happen? And they're just all these feelings are coming in their lives. You know, some envy, some jealousy, some things that are precipitating or maybe some conflict. And they're going, wow. 
See, some of these idols, this love of money, other possessions, can spur us into some kinds of conflict and can rear their head in the midst of conflict. Well, we really argue with me because you're jealous we got the cabin up north and we're doing the thing you're going to See, some of that stuff can rear its ugly head in lots of ways. Another one that people really don't want to often admit to when they challenge is the one called the fear of man. Fear of man. And this one is most commonly expressed in a great fear of an obsessive concern with what other people think about us. What other people's opinion is of us. And that sometimes can rear its head in a conflict. You know? It can lead to a preoccupation with, with acceptance, with approval, with uh, jealousy, with uh, popularity, you know, all those things that we can come into that whole scenario. Well, they're more popular than I am. They, they're more, you know, they don't accept me for who I am. They get, uh, and I get so preoccupied with what other people think. And it can really rear its head. Listen to some words from Luther's large catechism about some of this stuff, okay? Luther writes this. He says, many a person imagines that he has God and everything he needs, provided he has money and property. He relies upon these, boasts about them, and feels so immovably secure that he cares about no one. But look, he too has a God named Mammon. Mammon is the world's favorite idol. One who has money and property has a sense of security and feels as happy and fearless as if he were sitting in the middle of paradise. Very few can be found who keep a cheerful spirit and either fret or complain when they are without mammon. The desire for riches sticks glued to our nature right up to the grave, says Luther. Similarly, he said, one who congratulates himself on his great learning, intelligence, power, special advantages, family connections, and honor, and trusts in them also has a God, only not the one true God. The evidence for this appears when people are arrogant, secure, and proud because of such possessions, but desperate when they lack them or lose them. I repeat, to have a God means to have something on which one's heart depends entirely. He also says, true worship and service of God takes place when your heart directs all its trust and confidence only toward God and does not let itself be torn away from Him. It consists in risking everything on earth for Him and abandoning it all for His sake. You can easily judge how in contrast to this, the world practices nothing but false worship and idolatry. Everyone has set up for himself some particular God to which he looks for benefits, help, and comfort. Thus the heathen actually turn their own fictitious notions and dreams about God into idols and put their trust in what is absolutely nothing. So it is with all idolatry. For idolatry does not consist simply in setting up an image and worshiping it. It takes, primarily, it takes place primarily in the heart, which looks elsewhere than to the one God seeks help and comfort in created things, in saints, or in devils. So lots of idols can rear their head. And the last one is also a challenging one for some folks, because another idol that sometimes emerges, which becomes one of the most difficult, some say, to deal with, is good things that we want too much. Good things that we want too much. Go back to James 4. We looked at that one several weeks ago. James chapter 4. It kind of reminds us of that. James chapter 4. James says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. 
good things that you may like too much. Wow. So recognizing the log in our own eye can be very difficult. What are some ways we can identify some of our sins, some of those logs? Well, one of the primary ways is Word of God. Who are some other people who can recognize and help us recognize our own faults in the middle of a conflict? Your spouse, okay. Sometimes they're more than happy to let you know. Sometimes it's even if the conflict's with them, I don't know. Your friends, okay. Somebody outside the conflict, okay, that could be a friend or family member, something like that. You know what a real good one is that a lot of people don't like to use? The person you're having a conflict with. Why would I go to them? Well, I might go and I say, well, you know, Ralph, we just have been having some struggles together, and, and, and I, I, I can say I've offended you, and I've done some things that really have hurt you. I would just like to ask you, could you just reiterate those for me and just tell me again so I can maybe better understand what I'm doing and what's really causing the hurt? Could you just tell me that? And we can talk about that. Oh, I could never do that. Are you kidding me? Why would I want to do that? Why do people not want to do that? It makes them look weak. Yeah, weak. Makes them look weak. I don't go there. Because after all, you know, it's a conflict, and I need to win. And I can't win if they perceive me as weak. But that can be one of the best places to go to find out what some of your struggles are. You know, you say I've offended you, and I've hurt you real bad. Can you just help me? Can you just let's walk through that again and tell me what I've done and so I can see maybe more clearly and understand a better way what I've done? And if we can do that in a nice, calm way, and not get into the whole game again of what I that could be a real, in a sense, an eye-opener for us as to what we're doing wrong and how we're doing it wrong and what's happening there and help us really get that law out of our eye. Because it's hard to see as you're hearing the song with a tree you know. So we need to do that. See, we're afraid to do that because we don't want to appear weak and all that kind of stuff. So sometimes we get really nice. Take out that other hand up. And when we're in conflict with other people, we do all we can to try and cover that up. That's a song. And I want you to just listen to the song. You've got the words there. Hopefully you can hear it all and everything, whatever. Just listen to the song. The words are right there in front of you. I didn't mean it.
Yes. See? How, and we do that sometimes in a conflict. We make it sound so sweet and so nice. You do like you thought I didn't have a temper. <laughs> and we make it sound so sweet. And that's part of the challenge. Some of these idols that start emerging when we think about conflict. And, you know, and sometimes we need to sort out and go to those people maybe we're in conflict with and sort out what can you do to help me and, and how can you work that out with me. Because when you confess your sin, you confess your faith. When we do it in that genuine way, when we confess our sins, trusting in God for his forgiveness through Christ, we are therefore confessing that faith in Christ. That we really believe we are forgiven. And we want to confess that by confessing our sins. So these ambassadors folks come up with these things they call the seven A's of confession. You know, just kind of walk through them fairly quickly. Our time is getting short here, but we can do that. The first one is address everyone involved. Don't hunt and peck. And don't pick and choose. You address everyone involved in that conflict. You don't just pick and choose the ones you think you like, or you're going to like you, or are going to listen to your cause, or going to do whatever else. You need to address everyone involved. You need to avoid if, but, maybe. Well, I'll forgive you if, this, but I know you'll probably do it again, so maybe I shouldn't forgive you. Or because your behavior was that way, maybe I'm not really sorry. Or I'll confess and say I'm sorry if you change your ways. We're going to talk more about that in the next few weeks about conditions and all that kind of stuff. So we want to avoid if, but, maybe. You want to try and admit specifically whether it's attitudes, you know, whether it's thoughts, words, or deeds. You want to try and be specific. Not one of those generic, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I kicked your dog and ran over your kid's bike with my car and everything else in my hand. You want to try to be as specific as you can. Why? I mean, God knows what you did. You know, it's not for God's purpose. It's for you. So you really begin to realize what it is you did. And you're willing to admit what you did. And you're willing, willing to say, I done it. With better grammar than that. But you want to admit specifically what those words might have been, the actions might have been, what the attitudes might have been. Maybe it was something judgmental, maybe it was just an attitude like that, maybe it's just some harsher, reckless words, maybe it was just grumbling and complaining about it, whatever it might have been. But try to be as specific as you can. Okay? And then apologize. Notice what that means. Express sincere sorrow over how you treated them. Whatever that you did and how that affected that person. Sincere, underline, mark, circle, whatever. Sorrow over how you treated them. Say, I'm sorry. And then accept the consequences. We need to understand every sin has consequences. When I was teaching confirmation in a couple different churches and schools, we would hear that a lot from the kids in the school, because oftentimes the pastors would teach the eighth grade class confirmation, and you would hear some interesting dynamics from them. There might be some misbehavior or something like that, and this is a school, so there are some rules we have to live by in the school, and when they misbehave, you say, well, you need to talk after class, or let's go out and see the principal. Well, Pastor, I thought you were supposed to be forgiving. Aren't you supposed to forgive us? Well, yeah, I do, but that doesn't change the consequence for that action. It doesn't change the consequence for that action. We're going to talk more about that in the next two weeks. When people say, well, I'm going to forgive and forget it. An old Hebrew word for that, hui. Ain't going to happen. You might forgive, but you ain't going to forget. And we're going to talk about that. And how we work through that. But I need to accept the consequences. 
It might mean a strongly disrupted relationship. It might mean I have to come up with some money for restitution or do other things for that. It might mean there are consequences that don't change just because I said I'm sorry. Now that other person might have compassion and might change those consequences for me. But I have to accept whatever those consequences might be. Part of what we learn, need to learn to do. And then I need to alter, change your behavior. And understand, changing the behavior is not a precondition for forgiveness. Well, I'll forgive you when you do it differently and change. When you show me that you're doing it differently. See, we sometimes get in that rut with our children, don't we? Well, I'll forgive you when you can show me you're doing it better, you've got a better job, you're doing it differently, you've changed your ways. But that's not, it's not a precondition. Change is not a precondition. Okay? It's the fruit of your repentance and faith, but it's not a precondition for forgiveness. God doesn't tell us, does he? At least I don't read it anywhere in the scripture. Like, Pastor, I don't read in scripture that God tells us if we change, he'll forgive us. And he won't forgive us until we change. I thank God that the scripture says, while we were still sinners, he sent Jesus for us. Change in our ways was not a precondition. If you do it better, then I'll forgive you and I'll let you come into heaven. That's not in the Bible I'm reading that. I don't know. But that's somehow the one we try and communicate to people. If you change, I'll forgive you. And when we're in a conflict, we need to be often awful bold enough to ask for forgiveness. One of the most difficult things to do in a conflict, to ask for forgiveness. And the second most difficult thing, probably, to receive it graciously. When someone says, forgive, I forgive you, can you receive that graciously? Or does it come across like, oh, you should have. I mean, we, I said I'm sorry. But it's you know, can we do that graciously? Ask for forgiveness. Well, I don't need to be forgiven. They did it all. They, 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 I didn't do anything wrong. Why do I need to ask for forgiveness? It was all their fault. No. Log in your eye. Get it out so you can see the speck. So we need to understand all this, and it tells us this. Never make a confession merely to get a burden off your shoulders. Let me get this off my chest. Get a burden off my shoulders. So never make a confession merely to get a burden off your shoulders. Or to gain comfort for yourself. Well, it'll make me feel better. Or to minimize the consequences of your sin. None of those are good reasons to go and make a confession. Rather, your goal should always be to glorify God, as we said last week, and to minister or bring healing and comfort to that person you have wronged. How can I minister to them and bring comfort to that person? That should always be how we want to deal with all that stuff. Should never be a question. Well, then some people say, well, Pastor, what if that other person won't forgive me? What if that other person won't forgive me? Now what? Well, probably need to go back in prayer to God and talk a little bit about that. I might need to ask myself, was my confession really adequate? I might need to ask myself, have I followed through on any commitments I said I'd make, any of this restitution or anything I need to do, and all that kind of stuff, have I followed through and any of that stuff? And then certainly need to just maybe allow some time. Maybe everything's too fresh. Maybe things are too quick. Maybe I need to allow some time. And that's the challenge for all that stuff. Confession. I talked more next week about go and show your brother his fault. Well, confession, I'll get the good stuff. I don't get my brother is a victim. I talk about how some of that can help us and some of that can hurt us. We're going to do that. But understand, 
There are all kinds of benefits to confession. And to getting that log out of my eye so that I can see the speck. And that works kind of both ways. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, we ask for your strength. We ask you to empower us. That we may realize that instead of attacking others or trying to dwell on their wrongs, we can take responsibility for our own contributions in content. We can get that log out of our eye so that we can see the specs, so that we can speak with one another in love, so that we can confess with a sincere confession. Truly asking you to help change us, change any attitudes or habits that may be led to that conflict or may lead to other conflicts. So enlighten us, inform us, uh, repair any harm we've, we've, we've done in the power of the Spirit that we can move forward with great joy and great delight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks again for being here. <laughs>